we left last night determining that the axe head's on. Amen. If it wasn't, I hope you got it on last night. If it was on and loose, I hope you tightened up and straightened the things that needed to be to make sure it doesn't fly off. Amen. And I want to kind of continue that theme tonight, if I may, with the Lord directing me in the message. But before I do, uh, just hold your places in Joshua 17, and let me just lay a, a foundation. I, I learned a long time ago, sometimes preachers think uh, that everyone else read and study as much as we do, and that's, of course, what God's called us to do. But I want to make sure that the typology is there so that the message will uh, be a help with the, with the help of God tonight. But um, we all know, or I would say hopefully, uh, that there's some basic typology in Scripture. Now, you can get crazy with typology, but the Lord makes plain that there, are, there is some basic typology in the Old Testament when it comes to Israel. When we learn about Israel after G Genesis, we learn of them being under bondage in Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Pharaoh that knew Joseph, the Bible said, had passed on, and, and this Pharaoh doesn't, and he puts Israel in bondage in Egypt. And in your Bible, Egypt is always a type of when we are lost. Uh, God made plain to Israel over and over and over. In fact, they disobey and Jeremiah has to deal with them, wind up going. But he made plain, don't ever go back to Egypt. It was not God's will for them to be in Egypt. And Egypt's a type of when you and I get saved. When they cross that Red Sea, I won't take the time to turn there, but the Bible said when they cross the Red Sea, you know the story, God opened the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army follows, and Israel gets across and God shuts the Red Sea on them. And the Bible said not one escaped. Pharaoh and all his army die in the Red Sea. And when you got saved, the power of Satan over you disappeared. Satan has no, I see Christians with these bumper stickers, Satan made me do it, or with the hats or t-shirts. Satan cannot make a child of God do anything. You choose to. You were broke free from the power of Satan when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. You may choose to go back into sin. You may decide and choose to do wrong. But it's not because the devil made you. It's because you chose to. Amen. The Bible promises that in Corinthians that because we are saved, that there is no temptation. And that word temptation doesn't mean hardship, problem. It means to do wrong. God said there's no temptation that will to overtake us that he will not make a way of escape. So as a child of God, when we do wrong, we are choosing to do wrong. Because God's delivered us from Egypt. Y'all understand the type? Well, then God's will is to take Israel when they cross the Red Sea and they get into the wilderness. It's not God's will for them to stay there. As a matter of fact, God directly brings them to uh, the law and to the mount and then says, okay, we're going to go into Canaan. And if you know the story at Kadesh Barnea, uh, when they're supposed to cross into Canaan, they send the spies in, 10 spies, Joshua and Caleb are two of them. And, and the spies come back with an evil report, the Bible said. They said the giants are too big, the land's too big. Yes, it flows with milk and honey. And, and they brought back grapes from Eskel and, and they were huge. And, but yet the Bible said in spite of that, that eight of those spies brought an evil report and said, we cannot do it, we cannot beat them. And the children of Israel believed the eight instead of Joshua and Caleb. And they are sentenced to 40 years. God said, okay, you don't want to believe me. You don't want to trust me. Then I'm going to let you die. And Israel for 40 years just circled the wilderness. If you read Deuteronomy chapter number one and you just read the trek, all they did was make circles, spin their wheels for 40 years. The wilderness is a type of when we're not obedient to God and we're spinning our wheels as Christians. And then God said, that generation died off and their children, God said, I'm going to take that generation and I'm going to give them the promise that I promised, which is put them into Canaan. Some people, their songs about Canaan as far as heaven and some preachers type Canaan as heaven. In typology, biblically, Canaan is not heaven. Canaan is walking in the Spirit. Canaan is obedience to God. Canaan is wanting to do right. 
Now that's the basic typology in your Bible and I made sure pastor agreed with that before I preached that, amen, because I've never met anyone that disagreed, but I never want to preach anything contrary to the way he's teaching you and let me just throw this out. If as a preacher in this church I ever say anything or preach something he preaches different, y'all believe him and ignore me. He's the pastor. And by the way, you'll get your axe back now, amen. Someone uh, graciously gave me one tonight. So now that I have one, I'll return yours. <laughs> so, amen. But um, I just, just one, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I, I remember the first time Brother Willette, and I have said that for years, and I'd never had anyone say it in my full pulpit. The first time Brother Willette come and preach for me, he got up that night, and of course, here's Brian Treadway, and here's R.B. Willette, in my opinion, and, and he got up in the pulpit and the camp meeting, many preachers over, and the first thing, after being so gracious, is he said, now, church, if I say anything Brother Brian says different, you listen to him and ignore me. I believe that's right. Amen. I believe that's how, why God uses him the way he uses him. And so I just want to make that clear. But I, I did check with him. And that's the basic typology. When we're in Egypt, we're under the bondage of Pharaoh. It's hardship. No matter how much we try, there's nothing we can do. The only way Israel was going to get out is they had to have a deliverer. Thank God Jesus delivered us out of Egypt. But it's not God's will for us to stay in the wilderness. God's will is for us to be in Canaan. Now with that being said... A lot of times we get this picture of Canaan almost like it's for super Christians. And that most of us are just going to have to settle for the wilderness. Because we can't live good enough to be in Canaan. And some time ago, I just got to looking. I was reading through the book of Joshua in my morning Bible reading. And, and as, I, as I was reading Joshua, it hit me that the crowd that's going to get into Canaan was very similar to the crowd God said ain't going in. What is it that makes us a Canaan church? Does, do we not want to be a Canaan church tonight? Do you not want to be a Canaan Christian? What is it that makes us Canaan? Well, preacher, you got to be Superman as a Christian. I don't believe that's the case. As a means of introduction, let me just show you a few things about this typology. Number one, I want you to notice the difference between the crowd that God said in Numbers 14. You're not going in. You've disobeyed. You've rebelled. So you're not going to go into Canaan. And then the crowd 40 years later that he lets go into Canaan. What's the difference between them? You got the old group and you got the new group. And we all know the, the old group. God said these ten times you've rebelled. God said you've disobeyed. They, they wouldn't believe God. They tried God and tested God time and time again. They, they worshipped idols. They went back on God. They, they murmured. They complained. They griped. We all know the sins of the crowd that God said in the wilderness you're not going in. But in Joshua, this is the children. This is the group that's going to inherit Canaan. What kind of people were they? You know, I found out that they worship diverse gods. Joshua 24, 23. After they conquer all the land in Canaan, Joshua has to tell them, put away your gods. Here's the new group that's inheriting the blessings of God, living, walking, warfaring, and worshiping in Canaan, and they've got false idols. So false idols ain't what distinguishes wilderness versus Canaan. By the way, 1 John, he ended the text with little children. Keep yourselves from idols. Oh, it may not be a little old statue of Buddha or Confucius or Bahuala or any of the other ones we worship, but we can worship a TV. Not against it. We can worship our career, our children. Anything can become an idol if we're not careful. So if I allow an idol, does that automatically mean I'm in the wilderness and not in Canaan? Not necessarily. I find idol worship with both groups, the group that didn't get to go in and the group that went in. I find, I find diverse gods. I find disobedience. The old crowd was disobedient, but in Judges chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible talks about the crowd that's going to go in and how disobedient they were. You say, well, preacher, it had to be because they murmured, complained. There was division in that crowd. Well, I find division in this crowd that went in in Joshua 22 and other places. There was division. 
Say, I know what it was. It had to be the doubt and the disbelief in God. And that's why God told the old crowd, you're going to die in the wilderness. And I'm here to tell you that there was doubt and disbelief in this crowd that got into Canaan. So what's the difference then between living in the wilderness or living in Canaan? If both groups had diverse gods, if both were at times were disobedience, if both at times had division, if both at times doubted and disbelieved God, and by the way, can I stop right there and say every one of us that's saved and honest with ourselves, there's times we've allowed some diverse gods in our life. There's times we have not been disagreeable. There's times we have not always done what God said and been disobedient. There's times that we have doubted and disbelieved God. And by the way, I'm not preaching on tonight, but I believe one of the greatest sins amongst saved people is not believing the God of Israel and our God. I love our theme, believe God. Say, well, preacher, that's simple. No, no, I believe. You read Psalm 78. I read it regularly to remind myself, no matter what God did for them, it was never enough. Open the Red Sea, get them across. Okay, God, you did that, but can you do this? So God said, I'm going to give you manna. He gave them angels food, the Bible called it. Manna from heaven. And they said, okay, can you give us water? So he gives water from a rock for millions of people. Well, that's good, you gave us water. So, you know, we don't want bread, we want meat. So God lets quails rain down from heaven to feed millions of people. And the Bible said in Psalm 78, because of their disbelief, they provoked God. God was angry. God was wrathful, not because of what they were doing, but because they wouldn't believe God. And when they wouldn't believe God, this is the Bible said that they limited the Holy One of Israel. God, help us tonight. Are we limiting God in our life? I don't preach as one that's arrived on this. I get rebuked all the time. This doesn't matter. Don't seem, it seems like it don't matter what God does. The minute the next trial, the minute the next problem. Oh no, God, what are you going to do? Well, he took care of this, 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 this. Don't you think he'll handle this? I'm glad disbelief don't disqualify me from being in Canaan because if it did, I'd never be there. And neither would you. I believe if we get revival, our faith will increase. We need belief. Our faith is so strong, and again, that's not the message, but listen to me tonight. Our faith is so important. If you were to turn to Ephesians 6 and don't, the Bible said that that armor, that we're to put on the armor of God and that breastplate of righteousness in our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and that b- girdle of truth and, that, and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. And the Bible talks about that shield of faith. And what's the shield for? To be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The wicked Satan. Now he said that shield is our faith. And Jesus said you can have no faith, little faith, great faith. Here's what I believe. I believe that shield and how how effective it is, is tied to our faith in the God that we serve. Why do we constantly seem to fall to the fiery darts of the wicked one? Because we got about that much faith and we got a shield just right here. What's that going to stop? Nothing. Very little. Great faith, big shield. I tell God all the time, God increase my faith because I need a shield as big. Because I got darts coming all the time and so do you. I'm just saying tonight that when we think about being a Canaan Christian, being a Christian that God is pleased with and in the will of God, sometimes we think it's unattainable because we got to live perfect. There is no such thing. And I'm not excusing our doubt and our disbelief and our division and our disobedience. I'm just saying the fact of the matter is God knows our state and He knows we're human and He knows that's going to happen in our lives. But how do I know, preacher, if I'm in the wilderness or if I'm in Canaan? I want you to look at Numbers chapter number 14 real quick, and then we're going to come right back to Joshua, and I'll read my text. i got a long introduction, short message. So bear with me just a moment. Look, look in Numbers chapter 14. 
And in Numbers chapter number 14, look at verse number 20. This is the crowd that God said, you're not going in. And the Lord said in verse 20 of Numbers 14, I pardon according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these 10 times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear to their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into land where unto he went, and his seed shall possess it. We also know Joshua is the other one that wind up. Notice the Bible said that what the difference between Caleb and the rest of that crowd was. And by the way, Caleb had the same problem some of them others had. But the Bible said he had a different spirit. I'm convinced tonight the difference between whether you are in the wilderness as a child of God or a church is in the wilderness or in Canaan. I believe it's our desire. It's the spirit that we approach God. May I tell you, I fail God way more than I mean to. But God knows my heart. And God, Peter looked at the Lord. And the Lord said, Peter, there in John chapter 20, I won. He said, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter said, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, you know I love you. The Lord said, feed my lambs. He said again, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter, the Peter said, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And I understand he uses a different word for love. But Peter looks at the Lord. Lord, even in his backslid state even when the Lord's having to deal with him even though he's just been on a boat naked and Peter says God you of all people know I've got a desire I've got a passion you know I love you every stumble Peter made was done in honesty that he loved God he got full of pride and he had problems and Satan got to use him but it didn't change Peter's desire that's why on Acts chapter number 2 you want to know who it is that's preaching on the day of Pentecost it wasn't the beloved John it wasn't the perfect apostles. It's the one that more failures and more faults were seen than any of them. But it was also the man that had a desire to live for God and serve God. And on the day of Pentecost, in spite of all his mess, Peter stands up under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and 3,000 are saved and baptized and added to the church. Why? Because though Peter stumbled and failed and messed up, there was a desire just to serve God. May I say tonight, what's going to determine First Baptist Church of Bridgeport? And what's going to determine the Treadway House? What's going to determine Brian Treadway? And what's going to determine your house and you tonight is going to be, where is your desire? You're going to mess up. I'm not excusing that. It's just a fact of life. Anyone disagree with that statement? We're going to mess up on our best days. Why we need revivals, I'm afraid many times there's people in church that they lose the desire to just serve God. I believe there's many churches and Christians that are in Canaan and they think they're in the wilderness because somehow they're not living a perfect life. I'm just saying I see the difference between these two groups. But let me come more specifically uh, in, in, in our text. This group that I'm fixing to read about in Joshua 17, they have inherited the land. They've already conquered Jericho. Not only do I see the difference in the old group and this one, but notice the divine acts. And I'm just giving introduction here. The divine acts of God in Canaan. I won't take the time to turn to all the passages, but we see the we see the protection of God in chapter 2 with God protecting them with the spies going in and Rahab watching over them. We see the power of Christ in chapter 3 of them crossing the Jordan and then again in chapter number 6 we see the provision of corn. They lived off manna and now in chapter 5 they're able to live off the corn of the land for the first time in years and we see in chapter 5 in the last part the Lord shows up to Joshua and we see the presence of God. We see the performance of circumcision in chapter 5 and God giving them a distinguishing mark. We see the pummeling of Jericho in chapter number 6 and basically what I'm saying is all these divine acts God did for them without basically any help from the people. They didn't have to do nothing. God just did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. He showed blessing after blessing after blessing. Which shows me not only the divine acts, but it shows me the display of God's grace. 
around seven and a half years from the beginning of Joshua's leadership to the start of when they start dividing the land in Canaan in Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 13, around seven and a half years occurs. And here's the thought. Joshua in chapter 24, I've already told you, has to tell him, get rid of your idols, get right, quit fighting, quit doing wrong. And let's be honest tonight. How many times have you and I not done what we're supposed to do? Not prayed like we should, not read our Bible, not been 100% right. And yet God's blessings time after time after time has been on our life. That leads me to my fourth introductory point. There's a danger of ease in Canaan. If we're not careful, we'll get lazy because we're not doing right, but God's blessing. We're not where we need to be, but preacher, look, I mean, First Baptist Church of Bridgeport's doing guy fine with or without me, and, and I mean, people are being saved and people are joining, and God does that in spite of us. God's grace is, is amazing and marvelous and wonderful. There's not enough adjectives in the English language to describe it. But do you understand it's not because we're so great and holy and wonderful. And there's a danger tonight. Though we may have a desire to serve God, if you're honest, many of us take the grace of God for granted. And we abuse it. Well, I know I'm not right, but I'm going to get there one day. Know what you're saying? I just expect God to forgive me whether I deserve it or not. And thank God he does. They, for seven and a half years, lived off the divine acts and the display of God's grace. And there's a danger when we do that of becoming lazy as Christians thinking we can get away with half-hearted Christianity. I said last night, and I believe it, I believe this is a great church. I believe God's blessing. Can I ask you an honest question tonight? Is he blessing because of you or in spite of you? By the way, it's all going to be God, but God uses us. Are you the reason God can bless? Or is he having to bless this church, your family, your home in spite of you? And that brings me to my message, the drawing of the line. Up to Joshua chapter number 13, God does miracle after miracle after miracle. He doesn't require anything from them. He even lets the sun stand still so they can defeat enemies. He kills more enemies himself than they ever can. He brings the walls of Jericho down. All those things that we read. But in chapter number 13 on, God says, okay, that's enough. I've done a lot for you. Now it's your turn. And that's the message. I kind of alluded to it last night. We forget sometimes that there is a responsibility to the believer in this Bible. The commands are over and over and over. Flee fornication. That means I have a responsibility. Uh, present your body a living sacrifice. That's up to me. Abstain from appearance of evil. Quench not the spirit. He that hath no rule over his own spirit, Proverbs 25 said. The Bible said in Galatians, be filled with the spirit. Sing to yourselves in psalms and hymns. And over and over I could go tonight. And I'm simply saying that there is a responsibility that God is merciful God is gracious. God will bless in spite of us. But there comes a point in our life that God says, okay, I've done a whole lot for you. Now it's your turn. And we come to our passage. Joshua 17, look at verse number 14. He's distributed the lands to the tribes. 
And in verse 14 of Joshua 17, the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I'm a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto? And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. And the children of Joseph said, The hill's not enough for us, and all the Canaanites that dwell in the land end of the valley have chariots of iron both they who are Bethshean and her towns and they who are of the valley of Jezreel and Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph even to Ephraim and to Manasseh saying thou art a great people and hast great power thou shalt not have one lot only but the mountain shall be thine for it is a wood and thou shalt cut it down and the outgoings of it shall be thine for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites though they have iron chariots and though they be strong the tribes are through with the battle as far as the national fight and the land is now being divided and we have a situation in the name for a few moments I told you long introduction short message I want to ask you this thought how far are you willing to go or cutting down some wood Continuing the theme, I hope last night that you got the head back on the axe. I hope that if it was on but loose that you tightened it up. I hope if the edge was dull that you sharpened it. But can I say, just having the head on and having it sharp, is there's a reason, there's a purpose. And I said last night, God did not save us for us to sit still. And either we're moving forward or we're backing up. I've, I've said many years, brother Pastor J.D. helped me tonight already. I've said for years as a pastor, hey listen, don't don't leave here, uh, don't leave here the same, leave here changed. And I love what he said tonight. You are gonna leave here different. You're not coming, you're gonna walk out either for the worse or for the better, but you will not leave this service in this condition you came in. Never thought of that before. Tremendous. You're either gonna let God do something or you're gonna ignore it and you're gonna go backwards. There is no treading ground in Christianity. Let me give you three things tonight that I see in this passage. First of all, I want you to notice the inquiry in verse number 14. Joseph, the tribe of Joseph shows up and basically they, Moses, is, or jo, Moses gave the commands and Joshua has divided Canaan. Each tribe received its portion based upon size and based upon how much they needed. And the largest of the Joseph was the largest of the tribes. And it's the tribe that even Joshua come from. And so the tribe of, of Joseph speaks to Joshua in verse 14 and says, um, Why hast thou given me but one lot? and one portion to inherit. In other words, Joshua says, hey, we're big, we're important. Why we only get one small piece of land? Don't you know we need more? In other words, they thought that their lot was too small. They wanted something more. They even said in verse 14, we're a great people. And they even said we're great because the Lord has blessed us to be great. And listen, how, and I'm saying tonight, how many times have you and I gone to God and I hope on the altar last night and I hope right now you're sitting there and you're saying, God, I want more. I want to be a better soul winner. I want to be a better preacher. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better Christian. God, I'm not happy with my lot. I want more. Thank you for helping me last night. But God, what can I do? I just don't want to sit in the pew. I want to do something. What's my purpose? God, what's your plan for me? I hope tonight that we're inquiring just like they did. God, I thank you for the lot you give me, but I'm ready for something more. I don't see Joshua getting mad are upset that they want more. By the way, if you're sitting there tonight saying, I'm perfectly fine with what I got, preacher, you're in the wilderness. Not because of what you're doing, but because your desire is, I'm content. I wake up every morning and I try to say it with my mouth. I'm sure I've missed some mornings, but it's said in my mind. I get up and I say, God, today, help me be the best I can for you. 
And then helped me to be the best husband and the best dad. And when I was a pastor, the best pastor. Now I say the best church member and preacher. When I lay down at night, again, I'm sure I've missed some times, but I try not to. I say, God, and I evaluate myself. Did I do my best for you today? Was I the best husband I could be today? Was I the best father I could be today? Was I the best preacher and church member I could be today? And I try to give honest answers, and very few times do I ever feel completely satisfied with those. If you can sit here tonight and say, well, I, I'm perfectly fine where I'm at. You're not in Canaan. You're in the wilderness. Well, preacher, I believe I'm in Canaan, okay? Then you ought to be wanting more. Where you're at should not be enough. That's part of revival is getting a whole, by the way, revival is not souls being saved. Souls being saved is the fruit of revival. If we'll get what we need as a church and as individuals, the fruit of that is we'll be on fire and we'll be doing what God said do and souls will get saved and lives will be changed. Many times we think revival is an evangelistic effort. No, revival is will that Thou not revive thy people that we may rejoice. Revival is for God's people. And I'm saying tonight, part of revival is you saying, I'm not happy where I'm at. I'm not comfortable where I'm at. I do need to be better. I do need to be more. That's where the tribe of, uh, of Joseph is. They say, we're not happy. You've only given us one lot. Thank God for the lot. And Joseph, we appreciate it. But we're great and God's blessed us and we want more. I want a better home. I want a better prayer life. I want to be more of a soul winner. That ought to be a burden on everybody. I wanted to preach, and I know I'm in the will of God. I wanted to preach on part of revival. It's just we need to get back to being burdened that people are dying and going to hell. Your friends, your family, your neighbors, your loved ones, they may, God may come back today, and there's going to be many that's going to burn in hell, and we act like we don't even care. We'll talk about the weather. We'll talk about the sports team at the gas station, at the pump, at the grocery store, and never one time ask someone about their eternal soul. Do you want more? Do you want more? There's an inquiry here. Why only one lot? We need more. Notice not only the inquiry, but secondly, I want you to notice the instruction that's given to them. Joshua answered them. He don't get mad. He don't get upset. He said, if thou be a great people. Now, he's not arguing that. Basically, what he's saying is, okay, you are a great people, and we know that because he tells them on down that he believes it in verse 17. He said, thou art a great people. So this, if thou be a great people, is not. I question whether you are. He's saying, okay, because... You are a great people. Watch what he said in verse 15. Then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. I love this. Joshua says, okay, you're right. You are great. You are blessed. You do need more land. God's been good to you. He's done a whole lot for you. You want more? Get to cutting. Get that ax and go to cutting. Joshua says, it's there. It's available. God's for it. I'm for it. But he ain't giving it to you. He ain't just putting it on a silver platter. You've been spoon-fed enough. You've grown the grace of God enough. You've enjoyed his miracles enough. He said, you want more? It's up to you how much you get. It's up to you how much more territory you take. It's up to you to go and cut some wood. God's blessed you. And he said, if God's blessed you, then he says, get busy cutting wood. Go do something. You want more tonight? You know what God's saying? Take that ax we talked on last night and let's get busy clearing out some more land for God. God says it's up to us. God says we've got a responsibility. See, now the rubber meets the road. Clearing land takes work. They didn't have a tractor, a backhoe, a dozer, a chainsaw. Years back when I was pastoring in West Virginia, there's an older man there. I mean, he was, he was in his late 70s at that time, and he cut wood, and Oscar was his name. And I'd witnessed to Oscar multiple times, and 
And he would just go cut wood and, and then put it on the back of his truck and he'd sell it and he lived just in a little old rundown place. And, and, uh, and so he said, and one day he was talking and he said, again, he's up in his 70s, he said, I gotta go cut some wood and I ain't got no help, no one wants to work. And, and I thought, I can go help him and, and uh, give me a chance to witness if we're out there in the woods, he ain't got nowhere to run. I said, well, Oscar, I'll go help you. He said, okay. And so I'm thinking, and he said, I said, do you need me to bring anything? Chainsaw or anything? He said, no, I got it all covered. He said, just show up. I said, great. So I showed up that morning early about 7 o'clock, and, and we went to about 10 miles down the road there to the side of a mountain, and, and there was a bunch of cherry trees and some poplar trees. And, and I said, okay, where's the chainsaws? About that time he pulls out an ax. He said, do what? I said, chainsaw. He said, no, we don't use chainsaw. He said, we're just going to cut them down with the ax. I said, oh. What have I got myself into? I have cut wood, but not all day, and not swinging an ax. I've used a chainsaw. I had a chainsaw at the house if the man would just have told me. I rode in his truck. I couldn't even go back and get it. And we cut. Y'all, cherry is hard wood. It ain't pine. It's hard. I felt like I chopped. Or I should have swung an axe enough to cut down 20 trees. I got three or four all day and left some big pieces off them. It said, just pick out some. I found the smallest ones I could find. <laughs> the problem was there wasn't too many small ones available. Cutting wood's, hard. Cut, cutting wood's hard. You want to know why you're not further in your Christian life? It's not because God don't want you to have it. It's not because you're not capable. It's because you're not doing anything. You are as far along in your Christian life as you want to be. You're as good a Christian as you want to be tonight. Joshua, we need more. One lot's not enough. Fine, you're right. Great. You're a great people. You're right. God's blessed you. You got more than anyone else. Get busy. Grab the axe. Go cut some wood. Can I say to this church, how many trees have you cut down for First Baptist Church of Bridgeport? How much ground have you helped the church make up? How many souls are you seeing saved? How many lives are you trying to impact? If this church depended on your prayers, how many trees would be cut down because of your prayers? How much, how much, are you listening to what I'm saying tonight? Well, preacher, we're a big church. It don't matter. No, no. Listen, if you, I, 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 one, one of the, well, I, I can't say that. I better just stop because I, I don't need to divulge that. I'm just saying that when you leave a place, they ought to know you're gone. If you passed away tomorrow, this church ought to feel the difference in this place. As a pastor, I had people that died or people that left the church. You couldn't have even told they were there. It never changed the giving. It never changed the soul winning. It never changed the visitors. It never changed the spirit. It never changed the atmosphere. And I had others that they didn't look like much. But when they passed away, I'm thinking of one right now. When they passed away, I felt it as a pastor. I seen it in the church. The whole church felt it. It affected us in every area. I'm telling you, that's the kind of member we ought to want to be. Hey, your family ought to be able to depend on you. God ought to be able to depend on you. And we ought to be saying, I want more. If you're a Canaan Christian tonight, I'm I'm not asking you have you messed up you have I'm not asking if you don't have problems with belief you do I'm not asking you if you don't sometimes get crossways with God you have but what I'm saying is if you're a Canaan Christian then your desire is in spite of all that God I want to be more and I want to do more and I want to be right I have found personally that the ones that are on the altar every service are usually the ones that are closer to God and walking with God and wanting to do right and those that never come they're in the wilderness they're spinning their wheels because they don't care how much wood are you chopping well I'm waiting for God just to give it to me God did that at the beginning of Joshua he, he gave them Jericho he fought their battles he lets the sun stand still for a day but now they say this ain't enough we want more that's a great attitude how much wood you chopping 
How many trees are you cutting down? Listen to what he said. Verse 18, the mountain shall be thine. They're not only having to cut wood, they're having to cut it on the side of a mountain. I know what that's like. It's work. And reaching our potential requires work. You know I'm right. Parents, teachers, how many students are not doing good in school, not because they can't, but because they won't? And when do we get the frustrated as parents and as teachers and as principals? When we see a kid with intelligence, potential, and ability, and they waste it because they're too lazy to do anything with it. I talked to one of my children just recently, and I said, you're not dumb. Quit acting like it. Say, I wouldn't talk to mine. That's fine. You talk yours the way you want. My kids. (laughs) And I said, you have the ability to do so much more and you're wasting it because you're lazy. Does that not drive you nuts? What do you think God does? Oh, God, help me to be a better Christian. He ought to jack slap most of us three times a, a week. I know he wants to. I'm just thankful his mercy is very merciful to me. And I'm saying tonight that this inquiry, the instruction was very simple. Go cut some wood. Can I ask you tonight, what are you doing to develop your lot? God's give you a lot. You have an inheritance. You have a potential. What are you doing to develop it? Well, I'm just waiting for God to bring his bulldozer of mercy and grace and clear it out, preacher, and I'm just going to enjoy it. You're going to have a grown up lot with nothing being done. You want more? God said, go get it. Lastly, not only do I see the inquiry and the instruction, notice what they said is an impossibility at verse 16. The children of Joseph, boy, they got an answer. The hill's not enough for us. Okay, we may be able to take that mountain, but... That ain't enough. The Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. Both they who are Bessian and her towns and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. I mean, what they're saying is the enemy is too strong. I've got an answer for that. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I've got an answer for that. If you're saved, the Holy Ghost lives on the inside and that Bible's more powerful and the Holy Ghost's more powerful than anything and you're in a church and you have the tools and you have the equipment and I'm saying tonight, listen, they're saying the enemy is strong and then notice what they say. They use the excuse of a distant threat. They say, well, you know, uh, Joseph, you don't under Joshua, you don't understand. On beyond the mountain and on beyond that land, out there somewhere, uh, there's, a, there's a people that they're like giants and, and and those of Bethshean and, and her towns in the valley of Jezreel and, and they've got chariots of iron and if we take all that you're saying take we're going to be right next door to them and Joshua does not accept their excuse and he does not have anything to say about the enemy in verse number 17 Joshua said to them even to Ephraim and to Manasseh thou art a great people and hast great power thou shalt not have one lot only but the mountain shall be thine hey they're thinking great fine Finally, he's on our side. He realizes we're great. He realizes we have great power. He's going to give it to us. He's going to help us. But it doesn't change what he said. He said in verse 18, the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine. Thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. You know what he's saying? My commandment hasn't changed. In spite of your excuses, in spite of the enemy. Hey, listen, 
something you want more. It's available. You're greater than that people. You're stronger than that people. Your excuses don't hold water. If you want to be more, it's there. But you've got to get busy doing something. And I just want to say, child of God, in closing, hey, we can talk all we want about wanting a better church and a better home and being a better Christian and more here and more there. But if we're not willing to grab the axe and get the cutting, hey, listen, I just wonder tonight, sometimes I'm amazed that I go to churches and, and visitation and soul winning and just two or three come out. Now I know sometimes people go on their own and I, I just preached for a fellow not long ago. Church needs soul winning. They need to be doing something. And he admitted in front of the whole church after I preached on it, he said, Brother Brian, you've helped me, but here's a statement. He said, me and my wife went and went and went and no one else would. And eventually, we, he said, it's not right, but he said, we got discouraged and we quit. Just take an acre, take, take 10 acres. How long is it going to take if one person with an axe has to cut down every tree? But imagine what happens if you have 10 people, 20 people, 30 people. Thank God for what we're doing at the church. But I want to ask you, how many is actually doing some cutting? And how many is just taking advantage of the grace of God and other people's work? pastor said it last night in the invitation what if most of us or all of us and I get there's not everyone's a church but if we just doubled the amount of people that got on fire for God and picked up an axe and said I'm going all in with God just think about how much more ground could be taken a whole lot quicker you have to clear a lot by yourself it gets old boring tiring and discouraging real fast I'm just asking you tonight, do you want more? God said it's available. And revival ought to be saying, first of all, I'm asking you, are you in the wilderness or Canaan? How do I know that, preacher? Where's your desire tonight? If you're comfortable and content, you're in trouble. You need to get on an altar and you need to say tonight, God, help me. I've been in the wilderness too long and whatever it takes, I'm going to Canaan. Preacher, I believe I'm in Canaan. My desire is, I know I mess up, but I want to serve God. Then you ought to be saved. There ought to be something God's pinpointed in your heart tonight. I need to be better at or do more of. Quit waiting on God to miraculously work a miracle. He's done that. Now understand, it'll still be God, but God uses us. I think I've been playing on that. Pick up an axe and start cutting. What do you want tonight from God? Revival is God's people believe in God is still able to do it. I said it last night and I'll say it again. God will do what you can't, but he will not do what you're supposed to. You want more, it's available. I, I had to get right today preaching. I know that sounds horrible. I was studying this message and the Lord Holy Ghost busted my chops on something. I said, you're right, God, I'm sorry. I've been asking you to do it and I've been sitting back doing nothing, waiting. And God said, nope. I said, okay, you're right, I'm wrong. And then God showed me just because of my attitude change what he could do. So gracious. See, if you'll just make an attempt, God will go a lot further than you go to him. Draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. And what I've found is he reaches a whole lot further than we reach many times. But you gotta make an attempt. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wanna ask you tonight, What do you want out of, out of this revival? What do you want out of your church? What do you want out of your Christian life? What do you want out of your salvation? Folks are already coming. Why don't you just get out right now? Don't wait. Don't, don't have to be prodded, poked, pulled. Just come on. I know the piano player is not playing yet. Does it require a piano? Can we not just say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. I want more, and I've not been doing anything to do it. And God, tonight, whatever it takes. Is that not what we just sung? Whatever it takes, God, if I gotta cut a whole forest, if I gotta conquer a whole mountain, if I've gotta grab an ax and chop 20 trees, God, whatever it takes to get where I wanna be, I'm gonna do it. Folks have come from all over. Thank you for responding. Father, 
Lord, I hope we got the axe head on, tightened, and sharpened last night. But God, I pray tonight that we determine we're going to use it. God, I want to be used by you. And I want to be in Canaan. And I want more. Not for my sake, but for yours. I want to win more folks to Christ. I want to be more of a help as a preacher. I want to be a better church member. I want to be a better husband, a better daddy. I want to be a better Christian, God. And every one of those things is more than available to me. But someone's got to get busy chopping wood. Please speak to our hearts. I've done my best to obey you and I'm nothing and nobody and I'm looking forward to Brother Willette. I know he's far greater of a preacher than I could ever be. But would you take these messages? And Lord, my prayer is a month from now, two months from now, our church, starting with me, is changed because of this meeting and that we see fruit and results. Use the message. Help us in Jesus' name. Preach